evening and thank you for joining us on Sunday Interview. I'm your host, Gravazio Zulu. Now, the Copper Belt Energy Corporation, CEC, has had a long history of supplying power to the mines since the ZCCM days. But not too long ago, the company's dealings with the mines and ZESCO came under intense scrutiny with the government last year issuing a statutory instrument to declare CEC transmission lines as national carriers. The debate behind all this was that CEC was ripping off ZESCO and the Zambians by buying power at a cheaper price and selling it exorbitantly to the mines and also to create open space for trade in the sector. Well, CEC has gotten back the transmission lines and signed a new bulk and is about to sign a new bulk supply agreement with Zesco. But has the story of Zambians losing out gone away? My guest this evening on the program is Cobalt Energy Corporation Managing Director, Mr. Owen Slavut. Sir, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you, Gravizo. How are uh, you doing? Fine, thank you. I've spoken about CEC and its history and since the ZCM days. That's a very rich history. I want you to just run us, run us through, give us a brief background on how you have transitioned from this being a state enterprise into a private institution. Thank you. Um, so look, CEC is, uh, I would actually say, the oldest um, utility in this country. I mean, it goes as far back as uh, 1950, 1951 when the company itself was, uh, was formed. And uh, it's obviously existed under very different names over the years. Um, in terms of uh, the period that you want, you want to focus on, which is the time when it was under ZCCM, that I think starts from 1982. That's um, CPC, Cobalt Power Company, into CEC. That's right, that's right. So that starts in 1982 and it, it, it sort of transitions from uh, uh, CPC into power division under the ZTCM conglomerate. So obviously under ZTCM, the company was uh, always in charge of uh, the power side of the business, uh, looking after the power assets, looking after the power uh, needs of ZTCM. And uh, obviously it, its focus at the time was more of ensuring that ZTCM had a secure supply of power. And as you would imagine, in that setup, really the focus is more of uh, managing the, 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 the wires, um, managing the assets, ensuring that it's got uh, the key skills to uh, manage uh, the, the infrastructure. So come 1997, uh, the company was obviously privatized. At that time, government was uh, privatizing uh, the separate uh, entities and uh, uh, ZCCM, if you call them divisions because this was power division. And so this was one of the first uh, companies to be uh, privatized at, at the time. And uh, if you recall, it was uh, bought uh, by a consortia of uh, uh, National Grid uh, of the UK and Synergy of, uh, of the US. Um, and uh, obviously the focus then from that time sort of started changing because then you couldn't uh, sort of depend on, uh, on government. You had to operate uh, commercially, both in terms of uh, how you manage uh, the assets, how you improve the performance of the assets, how you make sure that you, know, you reduce uh, your losses and uh, how you look after your, uh, your important assets, which is human capital. And uh, uh, the contracts themselves because uh, before that the company really never had commercial contracts so you need to make sure that uh, if you're buying power from third parties which sort of integrate with your own power you had uh, sound commercial contracts and also if you're selling power uh, to your customers you made sure that you had sound uh, sound contracts so the company has sort of evolved uh, from uh, uh, from that time uh, to where it is today and uh, if I just talk about what has happened between 1997 to where the company is today, uh, a lot of things, as I've said, from uh, a sort of investment perspective, a sort of asset growth perspective, the skills in the company, how the company itself is managed, and what sort of company it is today, the company has really changed. It's a totally, totally different uh, Grown different company. or just changed? What, well, what, when what, I say what, change, what, it's completely changed its, its, its complexion. Whether you're looking at the size of the company, whether you're looking at its uh, organization capabilities, uh, whether you're looking at how we manage uh, the assets, how we manage our relationships, 
I believe we've changed for the, for the better. If you look at uh, a, where we are playing today, again, they have changed quite a bit because uh, um, at some point, which was uh, around 2005-2006, uh, National Grid and Synergy uh, decided to, to exit. Now, I should put this in sort of in two contexts because at the time, uh, National Grid used to own 77%. Government has always been a shareholder of uh, CEC through its CMIH. Uh, at that time, government was uh, a shareholder to the tune of 20%, and 3% was owned by a group of uh, Zambians at the time. Now, that was part of the empowerment uh, program that the government undertook as part of the privatization. At that time, so you could see that, that Zambians had a stake in the company. Exactly, exactly, to ensure that Zambians had a stake. Which so was, how has this shareholding changed over the years? Actually, that's what I want to talk to. Uh, what has basically happened is that uh, when National Grid and uh, Synergy uh, decided to leave at that point, what you then see is, uh, again, a group of uh, Zambians which partnered with a number of uh, international banks, bought this stake, of, which, was, of, which was owned by National Grid. But within a short time, then they decided to take the company to the market, which is uh, the Lusaka Securities Exchange. And so the company was uh, uh, listed, uh, I think it was in uh, 2009. Uh, and uh, so in terms of the current shareholding, and I'll speak to that, the company has a very, very diverse uh, shareholding. But let me just uh, speak generally about uh, what else has changed before I talk about the shareholding. So as I said, the company today is listed on the uh, Lusaka Securities Exchange. And then uh, uh, the company is also a member of the Southern African Power Pool, which it never used to be uh, before 2008. And again, that's a plus because what that means is that the company becomes uh, a sort of international player. It's able to play uh, in the market within, uh, within the SADIC. Uh, it's able to uh, trade with other utilities uh, within SADIC. It's able to participate in terms of se setting the standards mm -hmm and uh, you know, just signing contracts with uh, other utilities uh, within, within, within SADIC. I mean, I'm happy to say today, the company is one of the largest uh, trading uh, utilities in, uh, in, in, in SADIC or in SAP, as it were. And uh, obviously, all those are things that uh, makes uh, CEC a totally different company from the company from that was- The company uh, that everybody pri knew, the company that was privatized. I know exactly. we'll talk about the benefits and what that has to do with Zambians benefiting totally from, from the company as we go on. But I wanted to take you back. I know in the introduction, I, I, I did speak about uh, you being a strong player, a strong name in the, in the energy sector, but then your name was under intense scrutiny. That was last year. And, and, and one of the major challenges you faced was a frosty relationship with the government. And, uh, quite a challenging time for your company. Well, look, uh, Gravizio, there is no secret that, was a very, that that was a very challenging time for uh, for, for the business. Uh, but before I speak about that, let me just talk about the shareholding of CEC because you asked me that question and I didn't really address that. What's the current uh, shareholding of, uh, of CEC? And I think I want to start with uh, the CMIH. So the CMIH privatization used to own about 20% of, uh, of the company. But what you see is that that has obviously increased. So the CM today owns slightly over 24% uh, of, uh, of CEC. Then we've got uh, a private equity firm called Afema Capital uh, that owns the majority uh, in terms of CEC. But even that majority is not anything close to 50%. What they own is at 4.6%. Uh, so that is the largest single shareholder uh, in, the, in the company. Then you've got uh, a group of uh, other Zambians that own about 13% through what is called Zambia, Zambia Energy. Um, and... Uh, so when you actually put together this shareholding and you drill into detail, what you see is the largest chunk of the company, slightly over 60%, is actually owned by Zambians. So this is a Zambian-owned company. Of course... Uh, a Zambian success story, you would want to call it now. I would, I would actually call it that. I think uh, uh, as Zambians, we should be proud of uh, this company and we should be looking to developing a lot more companies like this because that's the only way that to actually develop uh, as Zambians, it's the only way that will create wealth and ensure that, that most of that wealth remains at home. I think that is an important consideration. Now, coming back to the question that you asked me in terms of the challenges 
that the company has faced in the last uh, um, two or three years, uh, I mean, the challenges were real. Um, first and foremost, I think we had uh, a bulk supply agreement uh, between us and Zesco, uh, through which uh, a, number, a number of services were exchanged. I mean, this is an agreement that unfortunately in the last sort of five years or so uh, was beginning to be misunderstood. This agreement started in 1997, so it came quite far. 23 years. We exactly. 23, 23. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, so what are the services that were exchanged under that agreement? One of the most important services was obviously CC buying power from Zesco uh, because uh, you have to realize CC owns uh, the power infrastructure on the Copper Belt. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, it's obviously an extensive uh, uh, power infrastructure, starting from a uh, uh, high voltage code to 20 kV. Zambia has two high voltages, 330 kV. At the moment, I think it's only Zesco that owns the 330 kV. Uh, and it's, be, it's, it's used mostly to transmit power over longer distances, for example, coming from uh, power stations that are owned by Zesco in Southern Province, let's say to the Copper Belt. Now you need that sort of voltage to move large power over long distances. The second largest voltage is 220 kV. And uh, 220 kV at the moment, I think is mostly owned between CC and Zesco. So the main uh, network, the, 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 the sort of backbone for the copper belt is 220 kV. Uh, one of the things you will note- I In think which you have a stake at CC. Yes, I mean, most of that infrastructure on the copper belt, the 220 kV is basically owned by, uh, by CEC. And then we step down those, that voltage to the 6 kV, to sm uh, other smaller voltages like the 3 kV, 11 kV, and so on. I mean, that's how the sort of power network works because you need to bring this voltage down to where it's now usable by the mines themselves, other users on the copper belt, I mean, industrial, commercial customers, uh, domestic customers like, uh, uh, like yourselves. So I was just talking about this agreement. So one of the things that it does is to allow that buying of power from Zesco by, by CC. Uh, and then uh, you've got uh, the other second important services that are exchanged in there, which is the usage of each other's network. And it's important. This is how power networks all over the world so sharing work. the infrastructure. So exactly. You it's not really sharing. You, share you buy. Infrastructure. You buy the use of infrastructure. Because sharing might look like you and me sharing a banana. But this is not sharing a banana. This is business. You actually pay for these services. So. When we use Zesco's infrastructure, we pay for use of that infrastructure. When Zesco uses our, uses our infrastructure, they pay. And remember I said we're a member of SAP. What that means is that uh, other utilities uh, in SADC should be able to use our infrastructure. And again, they pay for use of that, uh, that uh, uh, infrastructure. So we call that willing. And there are various uh, levels uh, of uh, willing that happen. So in my view, those are two very important uh, services that are provided there. So in, ter in, in terms of willing, you've got the willing that takes place within Zambia. And then you've got the willing that takes place where we sell power outside Zambia. We call that international willing. So again, in international willing, Zesco could come and use our infrastructure because we've got the interconnection going into, into the DRC. And then uh, we do use Zesco's infrastructure to get power from, uh, let's say, uh, down from south, whether it's from, whether it's from Mozambique, South Africa, Namibia, or Zimbabwe, who use Zesco's infrastructure. And then we'll pay applicable rates uh, for what is called international willing. And then uh, that same agreement basically speaks to how we maintain the interface, because our networks interface with each other. How do we maintain that interface? What are the power quality standards which we have, uh, we have to observe? What, is, what are the standards of, uh, of the service that has to be, to be provided? And then it's, it also speaks to how you deal with disputes. Because in any relationship, just like uh, personal relationships, there'll be disputes. Disputes will arise. And so you need to foresee these things and provide mechanisms for dealing with, uh, with disputes. So the agreement itself provides for how disputes are dealt with, such that if you have a dispute, it doesn't mean the end of the world. You should be able to go through a dispute resolution mechanism and resolve your dispute and move on. It's not the end of the relationship. So that agreement expired, and, 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 and then you were probably hanging uh, without uh, a BSA agreement with Zesco. Did, did, did you fear for the life of the company at that time? So, so look, I mean, the, the, an agreement coming to, uh, to an end 
or expiry is again provided in the agreement and what happens after that uh, is also provided so ideally what should happen is well before the agreement expires you need uh, to discuss whether you want to renew the same agreement you want to enter into a totally new agreement that becomes uh, becomes quite important and uh, for us uh, that is something that we always looked forward to to start you know new discussions and uh, be able to to resolve to resolve that now look i don't want to focus so much in terms of what happened so there were challenges at that time uh, we've sort of gone through that, spending too much time on... You want, uh, you want to run away from the challenges? I, I, well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much that. You're, you're about to sign a bulk <laughs> supply agreement with Zesco, and, and, and ERB has approved that. You, you, you're happy now? How soon will this be done? I mean, I'm, everybody's looking forward. That's, look, that's it's been, correct. It's been so, a contentious issue. It's been a long time of, of waiting, of debate, of discussing. That's right. So, look, we, we lost two years, which is 2019, 2020, uh, we didn't have any agreement there, and we obviously traded on sort of disputed terms. That's uh, a period which we need to clean up. And uh, uh, when the new management at Zesco uh, came in, we sort of engaged, and uh, we agreed to say, look, let's focus on resolving uh, the terms at which uh, we trade going forward, because that's, that's sort of key. And then once we've resolved that, then we'll come and uh, discuss uh, what terms actually apply to the last two years, which is covering uh, um, 2019 up to, uh, let's say, end of March uh, this year. So we've had uh, very constructive discussions with... Uh, so you've skipped 2019 and 2020 and you're negotiating for, for now a new we've, one. We've skipped, you, we've skipped those two years. How do you resolve the... the, the, the we've, I'll, I'll speak to that. We've skipped those two years. So what we've basically done is... Uh, they agreed the commercial terms going forward, and I'm happy that we've managed to wrap this uh, into, into a formal agreement, which, as you have correctly said, has been approved by, uh, the, by the regulator. And uh, obviously the two parties, which is CEC and SESCO, did initial uh, this agreement to signify that, look, we do agree, excuse me, with the contents of uh, uh, this document. Uh, with the agreement having been approved by the ERB, obviously the next stage is to have that agreement uh, signed. So we're working on a process uh, to, get, uh, to get to that point where we sign the agreement. Uh, my uh, sense is that we should have the agreement signed before, before mid-year, uh, which is the end of this month. I'm, uh, I'm quite sure that we'll have it uh, uh, signed because I don't see anything stand, standing in the way of that because both parties... Uh, are basically are basically happy with uh, with so the agreement, and as I said, it's uh, it's obviously gotten uh, regulatory approval, uh, which uh, basically means the the terms of the agreement are, uh, are fair and beneficial to both parties. Now I, I know you you're, you're quite happy, very happy with the, this conclusion of this deal, and 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 as a company, it's worth celebrating. But not everybody shares in your happiness, and I, and I think you understand that. Maybe I should ask you. Why do you think the bulk supply agreement is seen as the devil? It's seen in very bad light. Why do you be celebrating? Zambia still look at it with suspicion. No, I'm actually... And this is something that even influential people have bought into. I'm actually surprised that you say the bulk supply agreement is seen as, uh, seen as a devil. Uh, I think there, is, uh, there, there, there are a few people in our society who obviously have uh, a whole misunderstanding of what uh, the bulk supply agreement uh, is, uh, is about. Uh, and I think maybe uh, I should use this opportunity to try and put uh, this into, into context. Um, when I look at uh, uh, Zesco, and this is my perspective, when I look at Zesco, Zesco today is capable of uh, generating uh, anything between 2,400 to 2,600 megawatts. I'm not talking about Zambia, but just Zesco alone is capable of generating that much. Uh, when you look at that, um, when uh, KCM was part of uh, CEC customers, CEC would buy uh, between 400 to 450 megawatts from Zesco. Okay? So I'm trying to put that into con context in terms of how much Zesco generates and how much it sells to CEC. 
Now, with KCM today being supplied directly by Zesco, CEC is only buying around 200 megawatts from Zesco. So out of the 2,600 megawatts that Zesco can generate, CEC is buying 200 megawatts. Okay? And then somebody out there says, oh, look, CEC is a big problem to Zesco. Stumbling block. Because, Zesco is unable to make because, of, the two, because of the because 200, because 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 of the 200 megawatts. No, uh, look, I, I don't want to talk about... Zesco making money. I'm obviously not an expert on the, on the Zesco business, but I can speak to uh, the benefits that this uh, bulk supply agreement has. And uh, this is the nature of uh, the electricity industry. Uh, when you look at the electricity industry, generally the investments that are required in this industry are huge and uh, returns uh, obviously take uh, take long. Uh, you're talking about uh, a return on on on, on a full return on investments that could take anything between 15 to 25 years, which basically means uh, you actually need to back your investments with long-term agreements, and that's why when you look at the electricity uh, uh, or energy sector uh, in general in the world, it's actually operated through these sorts of long-term agreements or uh, electricity uh, markets that are obviously uh, sort of viable or bankable, if I can put it, I can put it by th that way. So you need the long-term agreements like this bulk supply agreement or the power supply agreements that we have with the mines to, to, to try and uh, uh, basically support the viability of, uh, of the sector. When you look at uh, some of the issues that have been raised by those who claim that uh, the BSA is a devil, and I should say these are obviously very few, and some of them I think uh, is probably uh, an issue of uh, not uh, having had the chance to speak to experts. There are a lot of experts in the industry that should be able to explain, to explain this, uh, and, and, and also just misunderstanding, assuming they have seen the agreement itself, just misunderstanding the contents of the agreements. So in my view, when I look at, um, uh, let's say, the tariffs this is something that has been talked about quite a bit uh claiming that no the tariff in the bsa is uh, one where cec is actually subsidized when you look at the tariff in the in the in, in, the, in the bsa and I'll, and I'll give a general sort of general uh, understanding here because uh, uh we have what are called customer categories uh in the in the industry so you've got uh, the retail customers which is basically the domestic customers and then you've got the commercial customers industrial customers and then you've got uh, the mines who are sort of uh, bulk power buyers and you could have some bulk power buyers in the industry category as well and some of these uh, uh, customers actually take power from uh, from high, higher higher voltages so one would look at what are the costs associated with uh, taking power to these uh, uh, bulk customers and therefore you would be deciding the tariffs because these guys are taking power before uh, other uh, investments are done downstream. So which means in terms of causing those investments that you're doing downstream, they're not involved in doing that. So they would have certain tariffs. However, it's also understood in a society like ours, depending on the policy, you could have some subsidies across. Generally subsidies, you should have them within a customer cast category. But there are rare cases where you have subsidies that, that go beyond or across uh, customer categories. And we've had that sort of thing. And uh, when I look at the tariffs, and again, I don't want to go into too much detail, what I actually see is that uh, CEC and in general the mines have been paying a relatively higher tariff in comparison to uh, the, other, the other customer, customer categories. The and story out there is that you've been ripping off Zesco, and in turn ripping off the Zambians, and an ordinary person pays higher a higher tariff than you buy the power for from Zesco. It's 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 obviously uh, at that point you may need to go into detail, and, and people need to understand how much do you buy power from from Zesco. Look, I'll, I'll, I'll again give uh, a sort of uh, a a high level perspective on uh, uh, on, on on this. Um, when, when you look at uh, the sort of domestic, commercial, and the number of these industrial customers, because for most of them, the tariffs actually tend to be in quacha. 
And at any particular moment, if you want to compare to customers whose tariffs are uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in US dollars, then you either want to convert the US dollars to kwacha or the other way around, convert the kwacha to US dollars. So when I look at, for example, where we are today with the current uh, exchange rate, what you see is uh, the, the domestic commercial industrial customers, most of them, their tariff is between four to six cents. That's US cents, okay, per kilowatt hour. When you look at uh, tariffs for CEC and the mines in this country, those tariffs are north of eight cents. Most of them are ranging between uh, 8.5 to let's say 10 cents. Now, obviously to say that these are paying lower tariffs than the other customer category is obviously not true. Buying at a lower price and, and selling at the exorbitant cost to the mines. It's, it's, uh, it's obviously not true. And uh, that's why you have a regulator in, uh, in this country. And uh, I don't think, uh, first of all, the regulator would not allow CEC to do that. And also, if you think about uh, who are the most savvy uh, power customers in Zambia, it's basically the mines. The mines are not stupid. They know uh, what the t where the tariffs should be in this country. And uh, therefore, generally conversations of tariffs with the mines in this country are very, very uh, complex and tend to be protracted. And the reason is that this is a power user who is very knowledgeable, so he understands First of all, the cost of the power infrastructure, it does understand. And it understands what an efficient cost is from uh, uh, an inefficient cost. So they wouldn't allow you to actually overcharge them. Uh, and if they did, that would probably be for a very short time because before long, they'll actually realize that you are ripping them off. CEC has been supplying power to the mines for years. Just looking at uh, CEC and... Uh, uh, the, I mean, starting from 1997, when pri the privatization was done, you actually realize uh, that CC has delivered uh, a lot of value, not just to the mines, but to other customer uh, categories in, uh, in the markets uh, where, where, we, where we operate. And uh, we've been quite transparent in sort of explaining the, uh, the changes in tariffs, whatever those have occurred. And almost all these changes are basically increments that we've passed on to Zesco, or they have been initiated either by the ERB themselves or the Ministry of Energy. And then, because obviously these are our customers, they have to come through CEC. And uh, um, in, th in, that, in that process, I think we've been uh, quite open in terms of what constitutes the tariff. How do the tariffs compare to the other customer categories? Why do we need the tariffs to go up? And, uh, and all those things. So I actually don't think it would be possible for CEC to charge anything close uh, to, uh, I mean, in terms of what, what remains at CEC, anything close to what we pay to Zesco. If you look at uh, uh, whenever we've done the analysis, we've always uh, come to demonstrate that between 15 to 20% of the tariff stays with CEC. And 80 to 85 percent of that tariff, now I'm talking about the final tariff to the mines, is actually passed to Zesco. So that gives you a perspective that there is no way uh, CEC... You're going to make more money. But I remember I need to ask you this question a different way. You've concluded the BSA agreement, the uh, bulk supply agreement. Why should Zambian celebrate with you? I think, I, I think it's, uh, it's uh, a key milestone, not just for CEC and Zesco. It's actually a key milestone uh, for Zambia. Why do I say that? If you look at 20, 2019, 2020, the electricity sector uh, basically has faced serious challenges. It lacked stability, it lacked contracts, and uh, what I mean, you used to hear about is uh, disputes. Or oh, this one takes this one to court, that one takes this one to court. Now, this obviously spilled, spilled over uh, to the mining sector as well. You look at the mining sector, the mining sector was always complaining about the need uh, to have uh, stability in the sector because then it allows the businesses, particularly the private sector, because remember, business flourish in uh, a stable environment. It's very, very important that you've got uh, a stable environment, an environment that encourages uh, private sector investment. So 
with the issues that we had in the last two or three years, you actually will see that most of the intended investments, both in the mining and the electricity sector, were not coming. Those were not coming. Because with, of your bulk supply agreement? It's one of the big issues. With CC and Zesco signing the bulk supply agreement, investors, as I said, because to invest in the power sector, you always look forward to this long-term agreement. Okay, because that becomes your bankable document which you can use to borrow money and all these things. Now, without uh, the existing players uh, having the ability to put in place a long-term agreement, you obviously don't give confidence to anybody out there to think they can come into Zambia and invest. But with these sorts of things happening now, we'll be, you begin to give confidence to, uh, to others. I mean, this market has been opened up and it is important that you know we continue to invest i mean sorry to encourage more uh capital and indeed private capital uh to come through i mean the government is talking about the need for uh public private partnerships and for that to happen the first of all the private sector have to believe that you know the business environment is conducive uh the business environment is assuring of your property rights that is quite key and i think uh the bulk supply agreement uh, to be signed between CEC and Zesco uh, is obviously one of those very important signals uh, to the market and to the would-be investors. But it's also more important to us ourselves, CEC and Zesco, because then we'll, we'll have the ability to use this document to borrow more money and to continue to invest in the, in, in the sector, but also to go and sign more agreements uh, with, with others. And in all that, there are a lot of benefits, first of all, to the electricity sec sector, to the mining sector, to the wider economy, to to to, and to the to the to the to the larger Zambian society. So it is important that you know we we actually give uh, this signal. I look at it as a very important uh, economic signal uh, to all those that are interested in doing business in this country. Now you you've spoken about investment and coming into Zambia. One of the issues you've spoken about is stability and and guaranteeing there would be investors that uh, their property rights would be respected. But there's another issue that definitely needs attention. That's uh, coming to invest in Zambia would definitely require a market. And maybe I need to ask you, how do you describe Zambia's energy market structure? Good for private investment? Look, um, the energy market is always evolving. Okay? And uh, what is important really is to know when to uh, evolve further as, as a market. And uh, we, as Zambia, obviously come quite far. Uh, not too long ago, uh, the, the market was kind of closed. And uh, I think in the, in the late or mid-90s, the Zambian electricity market started opening up. Um, it's still, of course, dominated by Zesco being uh, a, a vertically integrated uh, utility operating in generation, transmission, and distribution. But one could clearly see that uh, the market obviously has been liberated, and uh, that has obviously allowed uh, players like ourselves, who uh, got into existence through the privatization, uh, to begin to invest more and more uh, in this market. You've seen IPPs like uh, Lunsemfwa, um, Mamba, e, Ndola, uh, Energy, obviously come up as well. So that obviously is a good thing, but that's only a stage of the evolution of the market. So there's need to obviously move to the, to the next stage. And one would ask, what is, what is that What's stage? the next stage? Um, the good thing is that there's already a lot of work being done, uh, I think, by uh, both the government and uh, ERB as the regulator of, uh, of this market. And uh, what that next stage basically is, is, uh, is more liberation, I mean, liberalization of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the market. And uh, what is to be expected uh, in, that, in that process? So we obviously need to ensure that the market gets opened up further, uh, one of uh, the important stages in that is to set up the rules. So the market rules begin, uh, begin to change. So we've seen something called grid code, 
uh, being uh, drafted. So the first version of that, I think, came out a few years ago and is now uh, the next version uh, that is being worked on. What that, what that does is basically spells out, spells out the rules um, through which one can uh, uh, be connected to, to the grid. Uh, it speaks to uh, uh, basically how new demand can be connected to the grid. You're talking about the load, you know, customers and all that. And then you're looking at uh, how new supply, which is now generation, mm -hmm. can also be connected to the grid. Okay, so it begins to open up these markets such that anybody with interest in terms of investing in the electricity market can actually get connected. And then you start talking about open access. Now, open access speaks to how we give access to the transmission infrastructure, because not everybody needs to own the transmission infrastructure. And uh, the transmission infrastructure is basically like a road. If we already have a road between Lusaka and Kitwe, and it's adequate uh, for the traffic at that particular point, there's no need for you to go and build your own road just because you want to be moving between Lusaka and Kitwe. Uh, otherwise, it becomes an economic. What we need is if a road exists, we need to have rules that allow anybody who wants to use that road uh, so that they can use it. If they need to pay, if it's toll gate and that sort of thing. It's the same thing with transmission. So I'm sure you've read about open access. So open access now is, is actually in the energy leg legislation, the Electricity Act exactly, of uh, 2019. Exactly, so exactly. government has been looking ahead. So do you think where we sit now, uh, do you think this is something viable, something attainable? Well, with, it's, with the act in place as I said, and, it's just the beginning. all the movements that you're seeing. As I said, do you for think me, this is something we can attain uh, as a country, having open access, having so many investors that, uh, after that? It's, it's just the beginning. What open access does, as I said, it's, 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 it's one of those factors that encourages investment, uh, whether you're talking about generation and uh, all the other, other sectors of the economy. Uh, because open access basically gives users of the transmission infrastructure access to that infrastructure, which basically means if you want to set up, for example, you want to set up uh, a mine in Mukushi and uh, you have identified your power source, let's say in Western province, you should be able to buy your power in Western province, knowing that transmission already exists. I won't need to build transmission to move my power from uh, Western province to Mukushi. All I need to do is approach the operator of the transmission and they're under obligation as long as they're willing to pay to give you access to that uh, to that transmission so that's what open access does was declaring your lines uh, uh, common carriers uh, part of the move to have enhance this open access it's not open access and uh, declaring a, la a, a, trans a network open carrier or, or, or transmission lines in a particular network open carrier is obviously not the same what op open access is basically a fair way of give, giving people access uh, to, a, to a transmission network because then they are not discriminated against. They pay uh, a prescribed fee. So uh, you basically get treated the same way as any other user of the transmission network. Whereas when you declare common carrier, and unfortunately in our case, uh, the act that you're talking about was actually not followed in declaring CC common carrier because uh, what was said at the time was that uh, the fee for usage of our transmission infrastructure will not be set by us. It will be set by somebody else. Now, what tends to happen is that I own the infrastructure. I need to set uh, the fee for use of my infrastructure because obviously I know the capital that goes into this. I know the operations and maintenance costs. However, to make sure that it's fair, then there is regulation. So then I'll submit uh, how I arrive at my cost. And I try and justify that to the regulator. And then the regulator will come in and we'll have a conversation. Uh, why things maybe I need to change that and change that and we'll justify that. And once we agree, then it means anybody who wants access to my infrastructure should be charged at that rate. Now, if you're taking away that right of me looking at what it's costing me to run this bus business and deciding what I charge, obviously that's not the same thing. That's not how open access works. <coughs> Excuse me. Now to take it beyond that, uh, obviously what the market then needs is to ensure when you have open access, you then need to make sure that you've got a system operator. And, this, and in this case, you need an independent system operator 
Now, why is that important? So again, the system operator basically ensures that there's fairness in terms of how the whole network uh, is, being, uh, is being run, okay? So I think that's sort of the next phase where we need to go as a country. And beyond that, we also need to look at, uh, I mean, I talked about these bilateral agreements, things like the bulk supply agreement, the power supply agreement, are obviously very important uh, agreements and those should continue to exist because I should be able to do uh, a fair deal with whether it's another company or it's an individual who's got power to sell, that should continue to exist. But there should also be a market. We need to set up a market uh, if we can. That's sort of the next uh, evolution next of, uh, of, uh, of... In the uh, next stage, do you, do you think Zesco should be disbanded? Uh, look... There's been a proposition that it and, should be and, fair and, and and distribution... Bandly. And, and, uh, bundling is, and bundling and is, is, is obviously and bundling is obviously driven by the need to achieve uh, certain objectives and I should say in terms of uh, moving the next uh, uh, moving the market to the next to the next phase it's always a very important consideration I mean it's it's always a policy a policy decision from a government perspective if that's where so they, they want think, to they go think, but in terms of efficiencies what i can say is speaking from an expert perspective it's been uh, proven uh, all over the world that generally and, and, and bundling uh, tends to drive uh, efficiencies because uh, uh, when you look at uh, the way the power market works you've got generation which is totally different business from transmission and then you've got distribution again which is very different from transmission and generation so um, the way you move to unbundling, obviously, uh, as I said, it tends to be uh, driven by policy, what you want to achieve, and the, the path uh, that you follow, obviously, there, there will be very unique situations depending on the country, and those are the things that I can speak to. But I think, I think one of the things that I'm confident to say here is that uh, generally it's been proven. Uh, that where you've got unbundling, the efficiencies tend to be higher than when you've got, you've got uh, vertically inter in, in, integration uh, in, the, in, the, in the market. So how do you see the business evolving? Uh, I, I know after some time be, the industry will be so complex. And, and, and what do you see as, as, as a landscape, um, energy landscape in Zambia moving forward? Well, look, the ultimate... Um, market phase is basically where you want to drive uh, efficiencies in generation because because as i said uh, generation tends to be the competitive subsector of the el electricity market so you can actually create competition in uh, in generation uh, transmission is a natural monopoly unfortunately what somebody has built uh, infrastructure it, let's say let's just talk about the transmission line between let's say Lusaka and Kawe. Once I build a transmission line there, until the capacity of that transmission line is used up, there's normally no point in building more lines. If you continue to build more lines, what it basically means is that all that cost has to be passed to the consumer. Because remember, at the end of the day, the consumer basically uh, bears all these costs. So we are, if we're doing that, we're basically introdu introducing inefficiency. Uh, in the in the in the market and then when you look at distribution uh, again you can introduce some level of competition in distribution so uh, my sense is that we will obviously look at uh, how do we want to move in terms of uh, a introducing competition generation okay and then uh, the monopoly that, that I talked about in terms of uh, in terms of transmission, but because it's a monopoly, what then you tend to do there? You need to create what is called an independent system operator, which then just sort of superintend superintend which can manage over the, the the network, and then you introduce again some level of competition in transmission. So do you see yourselves as CEC operating at the same level, operating the same business that you've run 25, 60 years? Well, look, Are you as, ready for the change that is coming? As, as I said, um, the company itself has changed quite, uh, uh, quite a bit. 
And uh, so we are not the same business that we used to be, let's say, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And of course, over the years, we've, uh, we've, kind, of, uh, we've kind of grown. Um, we, when, when, when I look at uh, some of the market reforms, uh, market design that are being discussed and the issues of open access, that is something that the company has been primed for. And uh, I believe that the company uh, is obviously ready for that uh, that sort of uh, that sort of market, because if you look at the if you look at the way we operate today, um, we obviously provide certain services here in Zambia, uh, which is uh, supplying power, uh, and people look at the mines supplying power to the mines, and they obviously think that's the only thing that we do. I mean, we do supply power to some uh, domestic customers in uh, in Kitwe. It's a small uh, it's a small area that we supply, but the good thing is we have experience uh, in that area of the, of, uh, of, of, of the business. We do provide, as I say, transmission services. We do move power uh, within our infrastructure. And obviously, we've got uh, the skills associated with running transmission and distribution infrastructure. And uh, um, we also do uh, move power on behalf of others uh, across uh, the borders into the DRC. But we have CCDRC, which is a subsidiary of, uh, of CEC, which we set up uh, in DRC and were able to supply power uh, to a number of DRC mines there, where we have, uh, we basically partner with uh, SNEL. SNEL is the equivalent of uh, Zesco in the DRC, and we work together to supply power to, uh, to the mines there. So we've sort of evolved, and uh, we uh, certainly are able to, uh, to, to adapt uh, to uh, to any changes uh, in the in the market uh, market design. So when when we look at CEC, you, you you've spoken about the taking power generation projects, and, and 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 if I remember very well, and of course I think people do remember, you you've spoken about Kabompo, uh, Vapula among those companies, and and, and 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 you've spoken about this loudly, but we don't see much movement around there. Does the company have a problem executing these projects? No, I don't. I don't think so. Um, we are quite keen, as a company, to contribute to Zambia's uh, energy mix, and uh, uh, there is obviously a buzzword at the moment where people are talking about uh, energy trans transition uh, agenda, um, the clean energy, uh, green development, and all that. And Zambia obviously is quite lucky in that respect because over 80 percent of our electricity today comes from uh, uh, green sources. And so by us trying to venture into Kabompo, trying to venture into Ruapula, uh, trying to venture into solar and wind, uh, we obviously want to make uh, the contribution uh, to Zambia's growth in terms of uh, further development of uh, clean energy uh, sources. Um, the last two years have obviously been difficult for us in terms of uh, uh, developing uh, any of uh, those uh, projects. Um, if you look at, uh, let me start with Ruapula. Ruapula is uh, a, one of those uh, rivers that's endowed with uh, a lot of uh, uh, hydro potential. Uh, when we did the studies, on the Rapura River Basin, we basically identified uh, five uh, potential sites there. And at the time, we were keen to develop two. And we did submit that report uh, to government. Unfortunately, we didn't get uh, the go-ahead to work on those, uh, on those projects. I mean, we remain keen to obviously really visit uh, those conversations with government, because at the time, the talk was that government needs to work with the DRC government to government to set up certain infrastructure that was required to support the development of those projects, things like uh, the River Authority and uh, anything else that goes uh, with that. So we obviously want to support government in that process to ensure any of those things that are required actually put in place. And then uh, ourselves and indeed other uh, interested investors could go and invest uh, in the potential that lies in that, no, in that river. Kabompo has been again one of those challenging it's projects. It's a long-standing project. Yes, yes. I mean, part we've, we've, uh, we've obviously faced a number of issues with uh, with Kabompo. 
the the permits that we needed to get to develop Kabompo, unfortunately we couldn't get wouldn't get in time. The land itself was obviously a big challenge. It's difficult to get funded if you don't have uh, the title uh, to uh, to land. So um, it's one project that we're still looking at. We 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 actually did the initial uh, engineering of Kabompo. Uh, it turned out to be quite a costly project. We went back and re-engineered it, and uh, uh, it's uh, something that we're still, we're still looking at. And uh, we're obviously uh, looking forward to discussing Kabompo with government and also to, uh, to, because it's a project that we had looked at submitting to the GetFit, uh, a small hydro uh, program that government and KFW have been running. That program has stalled at the moment, but uh, we're obviously looking to engaging should that program come back as we understand it. So it's, uh, it's something that we're still looking at, but uh, like many other projects, there are challenges that we need to, to cross before we, we, can, uh, we can talk about implementation. Before we can confidently speak about them and, and the execution. Let's look at the mines, and, and as we close, I think we, we running, should be running out of time. You've had some challenges with the mines and, and the contracts running and them owing you. KCM is one of the mines that you've struggled and, and, and again had a very uh, frosty relationship, if I could call that again. Look, I should, I should actually say, <coughs> excuse me, overall, we've, we've had a very, very good uh, relationship with the mining sector in, uh, in general. And I think up to this day, we enjoy a very good relationship with the mining sector. The challenges that we had with KCM are obviously very unfortunate. And I have to say, obviously those challenges started when uh, the provisional liquidator, the time took over the running of, uh, the running of KCM. Um, and a lot of these uh, issues are obviously in court, I have to say that, so it's, uh, it's probably something that I wouldn't speak to in detail, but suffice to say, after obviously the takeover of uh, the provisional liquidator of KCM, a payments became a challenge. Um, to this debt, a KCM obviously OCC, I think now it should be over $170 million. Um, and uh, we're obviously looking forward to resolving uh, the issues surrounding surrounding uh, that uh, that mine. Um, it's an issue that, as a listed company, uh, is obviously a big challenge because our investors expect that we should be, uh, if we provide a service and somebody owes us, then we should we need to be able to uh, to collect the money, and uh, we obviously intend uh, to collect uh, to collect that money. And as a result of that, the agreement that we, uh, we had with KCM requires that these issues are resolved through arbitration. So as we speak, that matter has gone to, to arbitration. Uh, but uh, obviously, we remain open to resolving this matter through dialogue. It's obviously quicker if these matters can be resolved uh, through dialogue. And we'll be engaging uh, the, the new liquidator uh, to try and see whether uh, these matters can be resolved in as much as it's obviously it's a matter that's obviously still in, uh, I mean, under, under arbitration. Mr. Slav, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Gravazio Zul, and I'm quite happy you could, uh, you could have me here. Well, you've been watching Sunday Interview, and our guest this evening was the Chief Executive Officer for the Cobalt Energy Corporation, CEC, Mr. Owen Slavwe. We'll be back next week, same time. Pleasant viewing.